Um, Conservation International is a, we're a global organization. We have close to a thousand employees in about 30 countries and we have projects in about another 30 countries. So we're very connected to the, the, the conservation issues, the political systems of the world. And climate change is, this, it's like a veil of um, influence, or I call it an insult, that's happening uh, throughout the globe. And that's why we're here. We're here to uh, look at natural solutions. We, we, we call it natural capital. Natural capital is those resources that are part of the Earth's ecosystem that actually have value. And by applying and conserving that natural capital, uh, it, it is an adaptation, it is a resilience response to, uh, to climate change, and I can go into some specifics if you'd like, but that's the general strategy why we're here, is to use the Earth's, it's like using the Earth's immune system to, to fight off uh, a disease, and the, the immune system is composed of the uh, natural ecosystems, the forests, the oceans, the rivers, the water systems, and we can do it if we manage those resources correctly. Okay, can you explain us a bit more about this resilience you were talking about? What kind of action can we do about this? Absolutely. Let's talk about the ocean for, for a moment here. Now, the ocean has there's various uh, threats and insults that we, as humans who now populate the whole globe with billions and billions of people, uh, throw at it. Uh, for example, fishing, overfishing is one thing. Uh, habitat destruction, where we, we bulldoze mangroves or we dredge and destroy coral reefs and seamounts, uh, or we, we introduce synthetic chemicals, uh, pollution into the ocean, or, or even organic chemicals like nitrogen and phosphorus. So as we insult the ocean in all these different ways, and then on top of it, you have this climate insult that comes in, and the climate insult is composed of heating, generally, in the ocean, and then there's also a chemical reaction the increased CO2 in the atmosphere is actually absorbed in the ocean and it forms carbonic acid. So it's not a temperature related change, it's a chemical related change, a little bit different than the warming that we talk about. So the best way, and really one of the only ways that we have of helping the ocean defend itself from the acidification and the warming is to remove all the other threats, right? So imagine a person who has five serious diseases. They have asthma, they have cancer, they have uh, uh, AIDS, they have a, a variety of things, and you try to heal them all, you're gonna have a hard time. But if you can remove everything except, say, the cancer, then the doctors can focus on that, the immune system will rise and it will fend it off. And we've seen this in the ocean. Let me give you an example. The, uh, there's some big marine protected areas in the Pacific right now. Some of them are 400,000 square kilometers. And I've dived them, I've seen them, and I've seen the climate insult affect them. The ocean has warmed, a hot spot has formed over the area and stayed for six months, and it killed 90% of the coral. It was the worst, this is in the Phoenix Islands protected area in the middle of the Pacific. It was the worst coral bleaching event ever recorded. Well, there is no fishing there. There's no human development there. The ocean has no other stresses to deal with. And while it was the largest bleaching event we'd ever seen, it was also the most rapid and complete recovery we'd ever seen. So we have evidence that if we can take away the other insults, the ocean is a really strong system. It's resilient. And it can, in some ways, uh, battle these uh, changes. What about the negotiators of COP21? Are they aware about what you are proposing? I don't think the oceans have a high enough profile here. The ocean is, after all, the major life support system on our planet. It's the major carbon sink on our planet. It, it, it holds all the cards. It controls the Earth. And if we're looking at a climate planetary systems, we must have a large emphasis on the ocean. Now, you might ask, why don't we? There's actually a reason. There's a good reason. We're ter terrestrial animals, <laughs> right? We live on land. And the ocean has been this opaque, kind of mysterious, hidden, distant feature on the planet. And it's only in this last century that we've actually had to look what's underwater and we're getting to know it. So we're, we're probably several hundred years behind in our understanding of the ocean than we are on land. And also, we can't see what happens in the ocean. Trust me, if we could see 
what's been happening in the ocean over the last 50, 60 years, we would be appalled. The amount of destruction that's happened there, the amount of resources that we've removed. Um, so I think it's, a, it's a really a question of education. It's, it's, it's you know, seeing underwater, it's having more information for the negotiators here. It's not their fault. It's just something that we as advocates, we as scientists, need to keep driving forward. Okay, I know that you are also a Kiribati Island specialist. Kiribati Island is one of the most threatened country in the world by climate change. Can you tell us a bit about the situation of this country? Absolutely. Kiribati is an atoll nation. It's actually the largest atoll nation on the planet. It's comprised of 33 island, islands and their atolls. And let me just tell you, an atoll is a very uh, specific structure. It, it was formed on top of a volcano millions of years ago. But as the volcano died, coral started to grow on it. And over time, the coral dies naturally, it forms rubble, and then when storms come up, they throw the rubble up and on top of the, the volcano initially, and it just keeps growing. Now, sea levels have been changing over the centuries a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, 7,000 years ago, believe it or not, sea levels were about 60 feet lower than they are today. So they've been rising slowly. But these atolls have been able to keep up with it. So the coral is healthy, it grows, it forms this rubble, and then storm surges basically dump it up on top of it, and the thing goes up. So the, the volcano top is actually about 600 feet underwater, okay? But what's happening now is the, oh, the earth is warming so fast that the ice is melting and the oceans are expanding from thermal expansion that the system that had kept these islands above water for so many hundreds of thousands, millions of years, can't keep up. So these islands are doomed to going underwater. It's a mathematical certainty. But before they actually go underwater, they will become unlivable. Because imagine if you lived on an on a island that's uh, no higher above the ocean than you and I are above the floor beneath us. And you start to think about the next storm surge. Is it going to wash your house away? Is it going to, is it going to, uh, you know, they, even today the storm surges are beginning to show that. I, I was there a few months ago and a hundred homes were washed away by a, a king tide and the remnants of Cyclone Pam that went through the Pacific. That's never happened before. The people there are, uh, they're concerned, they're scared. They even uh, do things like put babies into, into coolers. Uh, when there's a big storm coming because they're afraid that the water is going to wash over. Yeah, there's a, there's a big psychological component to this. So this whole nation th that's been in existence for uh, thousands of years uh, has to deal with this. And what are they going to do? They, and, and, and on top of it, they're a nation that had the littlest to do with the problem. <laughs> and what can we do? Does any government care about it? There currently is no plan. There's no coordinated global response. There's some interest, and there's some funds that are now beginning to emerge through the Green Climate Fund, but the world is not looking at this as closely as they should. It's not just Kiribati either. It's the Marshall Islands, it's Tuvalu, and it's the Maldives. It's, you know, it's kind of like if you lived in a neighborhood and you had a really nice house, and then your neighbors had a house of more modest means. And for some reason, your heating system flicked a spark off and burned their house down. You didn't mean to, but it happened because of your lifestyle. And the next morning, you're up on your deck and you're looking down at them on the front lawn with their bags and you go, oh my God, isn't that sad? I wonder what they're going to do. That's kind of how the world's looking at this. We need to step up and we need to take responsibility for it and we need to act. This is, this is an existential threat. I mean, this is actually probably the best use of that word. It's a hard word to use. But this is an existential threat of a nation, of a people, of a culture, of vast empirical knowledge. And uh, it's something that the world has never dealt with. There's no legal uh, uh, work on this. There is legal work on, um, I don't like the word, but it does come into play here, refugees, when it comes to war, like we see in Syria right now. There's, there's guidance there. Uh, but there is no guidance when it comes to the uh, 
the, basically the, the the erasing of a nation through uh, our our climate act our climate activity our climate insult. Okay, thank you very much for your answers and for your time.